Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. I'm your host, Ben Carson. And I suspect uh, over the last few weeks we've been wondering what the heck is going on in Russia. You know, we saw the mercenaries marching toward Moscow, and uh, everybody's saying, is, is leadership about to change there? What the heck is going on? Well, we're going to find out today, because our guest today is a former intelligence officer, a national security consultant, the author of the book, Putin's Playbook, Russia's Secret Plan to Defeating America. We have with us Rebecca Koffler, and she will share those insights with us. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Dr. Carson. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and your audience. It's really an honor. Thank you. Well, you grew up, you were born and raised in the Soviet Union, and you came to the United States as a young woman. What made you decide on a career in intelligence? Well, I was uh, raised by parents who were against uh, the Soviet communist system, and they always wanted me to uh, go to America. So um, when I uh, came to America, I just really enjoyed the uh, freedom, um, all of the rights, the liberties, and I had a wonderful career prior to U.S. intelligence in uh, international business and satellite communications. And then after September 11th, um, I, I, I was just shocked, as many Americans, that our uh, country was attacked. Uh, my adopted homeland uh, was at risk, and um, I just thought to myself, it's just a matter of time before, you know, um, Russia becomes a threat, because the Russians never uh, accepted the fall of the uh, Soviet Union. And so I decided to um, go and serve as an intelligence officer, having responded to the call of former President uh, Bush, who said that uh, first-generation Americans, you know, those who understand the culture and the languages and how our adversaries think, uh, he wanted us to um, to help the country, and they did. Now, I got a, a, a real delicate question for you. Um, you know, when I was uh, a little kid, I remember... Nikita Khrushchev uh, very well. And, uh, you know, he was a pretty forceful guy. And he indicated that the United States would eventually be a communist country and that they would never have to fire a shot. And I suspect he knew what he was talking about because if you look at the congressional record, for January the 10th, 1963, it talks about the goals of the Communist Party in America. There are 45 of them. And they've accomplished almost all of them. And uh, we seem to be moving in the other direction pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, Khrushchev was a, a firm believer in converting the world to his way of thinking. Is Putin any different? Not really. Uh, you're exactly uh, correct, uh, Dr. Carson, and this is a very alarming development. Uh, in fact, it was uh, always Russia's goal to transform the United States from a free capitalist society into a uh, authoritarian socialist uh, society, just like the former Soviet Union. And in fact, there was a four-step covert influence uh, program that Russian intelligence, the KGB, ran to achieve exactly that. And uh, I described uh, that program in my book, uh, Putin's Playbook. And uh, basically, um, the, the, that, that's what uh, the Russians uh, do best. You just uh, mentioned in the beginning that Everybody is confused right now um, about what the heck is going on in Russia. Well, that's exactly the point. Uh, there's a whole program and doctrine called reflexive control uh, doctrine that is designed specifically to feed to the adversary uh, false information 
to drive him to the point of paralysis until it starts making decisions counter to the, his own interests. Um, so Vladimir Lefebvre was the uh, mathematician and psychologist uh, who developed this uh, doctrine, and it is taught in the general staff. And so the program that I uh, talked about um, that is designed to transform the United States into social, in a socialist country is based on that doctrine. And so they're basically the Russians, but back then, not only they were bombarding uh, the United States with wrong information, just like they do right now, they also infiltrated their own um, agents into universities, and then those you know, uh, ideas just flourished and took off like wildfire. And right now, it's not just at universities at the level of, uh, of schools and high schools, and pretty much, you know, most, uh, I think research shows that uh, most young people believe that socialism is a wonderful system, that you basically don't have to work, that, that somehow everything is going to be given to them. And that's what the Soviets always wanted and uh, Putin wants as well. Yeah, very interesting. You know, we sit there and we gloat saying that we won the Cold War, but uh, there's a much bigger war going on here. And uh, I think uh, we're being played. And I, I hope people will get your book and read it and uh, begin to understand some of these forces and why these things are happening. You know, we think, eh, maybe this is just the way things are. No, these things are planned uh, by people who are very skillful. And, uh, you know, Putin, I wonder about him. Um, do you get the impression that he will ever tuck his tail between his legs and retreat, uh, you know, regarding something like the war in Ukraine? Or would he rather blow up the world than to do that? I mean, uh, uh, neither, uh, doctor. So, well, first of all, the, uh, it is not in his uh, mindset. It is not his psychological profile to uh, run away. Right. Um, there's um, there's a piece I think I've written in the New York Post uh, maybe about a year ago um, about Putin being uh, cornered like a rat. Right. There was an episode uh, that Putin describes in his autobiography when uh, he was a teenager. He was he was he was pretty much a juvenile delinquent, and he was chasing rats in his apartment building in uh, Saint Petersburg. And he has noticed that um, after he chased the rat into the corner, the, the rat started attacking him. And so that was a very interesting uh, observation that he made, and he bases uh, his uh, strategy, actually, uh, on um, often on that. So uh, when Putin is cornered, he fights back. Um, he doesn't want to blow up the world necessarily, but he that what he does want is he wants to deter the United States from what he believes uh, uh, we are doing is interfering in his backyard. And in order to do that, he did develop a, uh, a doctrine, a nuclear Armageddon type of doctrine that um, envisions a detonation of tactical nuclear uh, weapons in the battlefield Right, in order to just shock the opponents, shock the Europeans and the Americans into backing out. There's also another doctrine that is targeting the U.S. homeland uh, this, with cyber Armageddon, space Armageddon. Um, yes, there is a doctrine that targets the U.S. with nuclear Armageddon, but he doesn't want to do that. There's an escalation ladder uh, it can lead to that if the U.S. doesn't get the message, according to the Russian uh, strategist. But uh, we're, we're not there. A lot of things would need to happen um, before that step is taken. The, um, the threshold for that is super, super high. Uh, but there is a, a, a plan B, right? It's a, it's a catch-on uh, type of strategy. And this is exactly why uh, President Biden, remember how he warned us himself 
that the threat of nuclear Armageddon issued by Putin is real. Well, then why in the world then then President Biden is kind of leading up, you know, to that to that leading us to that cliff, you know, um, makes no sense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, uh, a name that nobody really knew, uh, Prigozhin, uh, until recently. Uh, who the heck is he? Yeah, so uh, Prigozhin and Dara Putin are kind of like two peas in the pod, right? Um, Evgeny Prigozhin is, um, he is the head of the uh, Wagner Group. Uh, the Wagner Group is uh, a private military, military company, a PMC, but it's much more than that. It's not a PMC in the traditional sense that we use. Um, like, let's say we have uh, Blackwater, right, uh, that Eric uh, Prince uh, founded. I think he renamed it to Academy, but... Those um, uh, groups conduct their paramilitary ops. You know, we use them, but but uh, the Wagner is an extension of the Russian state. Okay, it was created with specific purpose uh, to uh, to do what the Russians called delicate uh, operations. So, um, precaution. So they can't, uh, they can't be hired by another country as mercenaries. It has to be something that's in line with the Russian philosophy. Well, actually, you could, they could be, as long as it aligns with, the, they actually all over Africa, you know, con conducting destabilization of, uh, operations. As long as it aligns with the mission of the Russian state, it could be. But mostly uh, they employed when the uh, hand of the Kremlin needs to be hidden, you know, plausible deniability, right? But before he became the um, the head, the commander of the Wagner Group, uh, he he was also a CEO of a multi-million dollar uh, catering uh, business that served meals to the Kremlin. Uh, Prigozhin had very humble beginnings, and uh, he started off as uh, really as a juvenile uh, delinquent. He uh, committed his first crime uh, between 16 and 17 when he beat the woman senselessly in order to uh, steal her jewelry and her purse. Um, so he was, he was jailed, but then after he got out, he really transformed his life um, and became from sort of a, a, a salesman of a hot dog stand all the way to, you know, the, the CEO of, uh, of Concord Management. Uh, he is also in charge of the so-called Internet Research Agency, which is a cover company for the Russian state, um, the one that orchestrated, or rather served as an executive agent for Russian intelligence to orchestrate election interference in uh, 2016 in the United mm -hmm. States. But just to make it clear, they didn't do it to elect former President Trump, but rather to foment discord and disorder and to pit Americans one against another and to cause this turmoil, which they pretty much achieved because- They did a good job. They, yes. Yeah, they, Putin is pleased, very pleased uh, with that. Wow. Well, is he is he close to to Putin, or is it just a, a convenience arrangement? So, well, it's both. It's both, right? He's one of the uh, he's one of the uh, closest uh, allies of Putin's. Uh, they they go back uh, approximately twenty years. Uh, Putin trusts Prigozhin to the point where he, you know, and Putin is paranoid about poisoning and being poisoned. Right? Um, um, surprise, surprise! The guy who uh, who authorizes routinely, you know, poisonings and other types of um, uh, assassinations and murders. So, but Putin has allowed Prigozhin to serve him food and drink. So, um, but in terms of uh, convenience, everything, everybody who is in Putin's uh, immediate circle uh, has to be convenient to him. There are just no, you know, no random people there. You know, it has to be somebody whom he trusts, somebody who is extremely loyal to him, and somebody who performs a very specific, you know, function 
uh, for him, for Mother Russia, you know, um, people like that. Uh, as we're trying to put this map together of of who's important and what's going on in Russia, um, Sergei Shoigu, who is he and how does he fit into all of this? So Shoigu is the uh, current Minister of Defense in charge of the uh, Russian Armed Forces, and uh, he was also close uh, to Putin. Um, Putin appointed him to be the defense minister because he trusted uh, Shoigu's judgment, um, but Shoigu was never a military man. He basically was in charge some of, of, of some um, agencies that are similar to our FEMA, right? But it's, it, it's not exactly the same because uh, the Russians use domestic security uh, and... Uh, environmental security kind of like is a, is, a, is a one mission. Why? It's because the Russians are very, you know, uh, uh, paranoid because environmental disasters could be used uh, deliberately by an adversary to attack. This is kind of what happened, um, you know, in uh, with the Nord Stream pipeline, the Russian sub, you know, uh, are behind that kind of sabotage operations with the Kahovka Dam. Right, they're constantly, um, so that's the doctrine. So, but he was never a military man until Putin gave him that rank. You remember, Putin, Putin couldn't do anything in Russia. You know, he could orchestrate the change of the constitution to extend his own presidency, which is exactly what he did. So, um, so Shoigu was not popular uh, exactly with the Russian uh, military because he's not a military guy, but, uh, uh, Putin trusted him. You see a lot of pictures of uh, of Putin and uh, Shoigu uh, fishing. You know, Bearchester. Uh, they they spent a lot of time together. So um, right now, my analysis is that Putin's uh, faith and trust in Shoigu has diminished. But he needs some sort of pretext to do a change. Because this would be a big deal, right, in the middle of an active conflict, or a so-called uh, special operations, as they call it, in Ukraine, to change the top leadership of the Russian military. And uh, that is potentially another reason, there are many other reasons why uh, I assess that uh, the whole Putin Prigozhin uh, fallout and uh, the so-called coup is a false flag operation, but that um, switching out uh, some of the leadership and purging people that are potentially not exactly loyal uh, to Putin, that those are also part of the goals that, um, that uh, Putin had in mind. Does this whole rebellion uh, that was precipitated, is that weaken Putin or was it part of his plan to, to, to gain more attention and I'm, you know, I, I don't really trust him. He's, he seems to be a pretty clever guy, and he was a KGB agent, and he, he knows how to manipulate opinion. Exactly. So, um, so it's exactly the opposite. Putin is not weakened uh, right now. Um, here's why. So the Russians right now have rallied behind Putin because from their perspective, Putin has saved Mother Russia from uh, regime collapse. The Russian newspapers are screaming with headlines, you know, that uh, Putin chased away the traitors um, and uh, now Russia needs to galvanize uh, support behind Putin. And um, um, what's very revealing is uh, shortly after uh, Prigozhin supposedly changed his mind, just like that, you know, having come uh, within just a few kilometers uh, from Moscow, he decided, oh, you know, never mind, I'm going to go back. So Putin made this speech uh, in which he invoked, you know, primordial uh, fears uh, for the Russians, and that's the fear of the 1917 revolution, um, because he said, 
the West is behind this. He basically implied that uh, the whole who was orchestrated by the West. Um, and, uh, and so if we don't all unite, if we don't come as one behind, you know, the, the, the Kremlin, the leadership, uh, the country is going to collapse. And so the other uh, narrative that he threw out there that uh, the Russians are very, very uh, favorably to predisposed to is that the West is trying to destroy Russia, is trying to orchestrate the strategic defeat of Russia. And of course, the Russians believe it because President Biden himself said that uh, this man cannot remain in power. You know, he's a war criminal. Uh, uh, Lloyd Austin, our Secretary of Defense, said that uh, U.S. will provide um, assistance to Ukraine indefinitely as long as needed because uh, we need to defeat Russia not defeat, I'm sorry, I'm escorting him, uh, to weaken Russia militarily and economically. So, of course, the Russians believe that. And so the support for Putin has now increased, although the uh, Western um, commentary, so to speak, is, uh, is um, saying Putin is weakened. You know, well, that was another uh, goal for Putin, is to spread the narrative that he's weak. Because right. if he's weak, why do we need to keep pumping in billions of dollars uh, into Ukraine? You know, he can't possibly win the war. He can't possibly attack NATO. You know, let just Zelensky, you know, take care of the son of a part of my French. Uh, you know, Zelensky could take care of Putin, right? Why does he need all this weaponry uh, if Putin is weak right. or is Russia going to collapse? So that's another uh, yeah. line of deception. Well, aren't we, uh, aren't we kind of playing into Putin's hands uh, with the way that we're handling the war in the sense that we just keep pumping money in there? But because of all the oil money he can get, because of the way that we foolishly use our energy policies, uh, he could go on basically forever and bleed us to death in terms of money and military equipment. Uh, until we get to a point where we're so weakened that uh, China can have their way. Uh, I mean, could is he clever enough to sort of figure that out? Oh, he already figured it out. <laughs> yeah, Putin is evil. <laughs> Putin is evil, but he's a highly intelligent man, and uh, he's a strategist. Um, because remember, judo is his uh, is his craft. That's how he sort of. Um, uh, he was almost uh, on the criminal path when he was a teenager, but then he met his judo teacher, and that teacher completely transformed him into, you know, into a different uh, type of person. And so uh, he thinks several steps ahead, and one of the uh, precepts of judo is to use the strength of your opponent against him. Right, and that's Putin is always on the lookout for uh, for weakness. So, um, so yes, the idea is to bleed Ukraine, uh, and you know, hope that the United States will figure out that the sanctions are not going to work. That eventually, it's going to deplete its own resources. So, uh, this war is unwinnable for Ukraine. I can't, it's mathematically impossible. Uh, for Ukraine to achieve victory the way that victory um, is defined by Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Why is that? It's because the strategy that Putin's using is uh, the same strategy um, the Soviets used in World War II, and that is the strategy of attrition. Uh, the Russians lost more than 20 million people in uh, World War II, and they are prepared to lose a lot in this war. And with the population of Russia being 143 million uh, people and Ukrainian population being 43 million people. So the math just doesn't add up, right? So Russia holds tremendous advantage. Putin has so many more, you know, much more flesh to throw into the meat grinder, right? right. And so China is actually the biggest winner, as, as you, you just mentioned, China. Um, the biggest winner in this conflict because, you know, China is seeing two of its top geopolitical adversaries 
Russia and the United States are fighting a proxy war and depleting their respective combat arsenals. So Wargaming has shown, um, Dr. Carson, and uh, as you said, I'm a former DIA intelligence officer. DIA is a uh, military counterpart to CIA, so we routinely conduct war games. Uh, we've done it with respect to Russia, China. So Wargaming has shown that uh, the U.S. would run out of long-range missiles and uh, some, some other military hardware in a matter of days. Okay, we are already in the hole as far as um, uh, our javelins, our stingers, you know, our production capacity mm -hmm. is just incapable to uh, uh, to replenish that arsenal. Our 155 millimeter uh, ammo is um, is like about five years. Like we 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 are basically in the hole. We can't replenish it, and so China obviously is getting ready to. Um, um, to secure control of Taiwan in the next couple of years. And it's just really plays to their advantage, the fact that we yeah. are supporting this war. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, what's the relationship between Lukashenko and Prigozhin? Well, uh, I'll start off, if I may, with the relationship between um, Lukashenko and Putin. Uh, those are two, uh, the allies, uh, Belarus is basically a, a client state or even a vassal state of, uh, of Russia's, um, uh, they, they're even part of the union, the union, um, uh, the union state, they call it, Russia and Belarus. Uh, Belarus is highly dependent on Russia for many things, economically and militarily, um, and, uh, it has always been. Uh, it never sort of uh, shattered its uh, Soviet past. Um, and so Lukashenko basically does what Putin wants him to do. Um, and uh, Rigorshin and Lukashenko have no relationship, uh, effectively. So Lukashenko just stepped in to, um, to do what Putin wanted him to do. And that is, so my intelligence assessment, um, I think I've, I've written about it uh, recently, is that uh, another goal was to open second front in Belarus. So that's why Prigozhin is there. Like miraculously, right, uh, Lukashenko said, you know, come on in. And uh, remember, Prigozhin, uh, or Putin rather, uh, stated just a few years ago that uh, treason is the worst crime in the world. And so somehow, you know, Lukashenko just didn't give Prigozhin to, to Putin. He gave him refuge. That's, you know, implausible. So, so what we have right now is uh, Prigozhin and his Wagner team uh, in Belarus. And uh, European satellite imagery has confirmed that the military base, the abandoned military base that uh, Prigozhin uh, offered to the Wagner group, is now uh, building up, like it's expanding. So, um, so we've got those guys, we've got tactical nukes that uh, Lukashenko just received uh, from Putin, and they are in a strategic position to threaten not only Ukraine to come mm. you know, from a different side, but also to directly threaten NATO because Belarus borders um, sure. uh, Latvia and Lithuania. So, so Putin effectively, this, through this ruse, right, this false flag operation, this deception, uh, Putin has uh, set up a combat-ready strategic reserve to conduct a, a, another, you know, a blitzkrieg potentially another type front. of operation, another front, yeah. using his best fighting force. Because the yeah. Wagner group, remember, they are former convicts. They are battle-hardened. Yeah. These people are, are ruthless, and they conduct operations, as, as we talked in the beginning, all over the world. So they're very right. experienced uh, relative to what uh, Prigozhin said, the, the children that Shoigu, Sergei Shoigu is hiring, you know, the 18-year-olds who, who are not trained, and they're just being thrown into the meat grinder. The, the, the Wagner, they call themselves musicians. Uh, Wagner, just a, a, a little um, 
a side note, the reason it's called Wagner is because uh, Prigozhin's favorite composer is uh, Richard Wagner. Uh, oh, okay? okay. Right. And so that's I why they call about them, that. Yeah, okay. that's why it's called Wagner, and they call themselves Musikanti the, uh, in Russian. It's uh, musicians. It, they even have it on their, on their patches. Now, in this uh, whole Belarus situation, uh, I understand that some tactical nuclear weapons have been moved there as well. Uh, not strategic nuclear weapons, but tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, and if they use those on the on the battlefield, seems like things will be over pretty quickly. Um, you think they 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 might actually use them? I do. Um, there's um, there's a special doctrine, like with with the Russian uh, war fighting strategy. Like everything is explained. Like I can trace, you know, everything that's going on to like a very specific doctrine. Like I said, you know, the whole ruse, the deception is reflexive control, right? So this the nuclear doctrine is called escalate to deescalate. It, it was specifically designed uh, against the U.S. and NATO to deter conflict or to win conflict on terms favorable to Russia. How so? Uh, well, first, why? Uh, the Russians developed that doctrine because they fear their conventional inferiority relative to the United States. The U.S. has the best war fighting force in military history, right? We do things, you know, uh, quickly. You know, we put um, iron on target with precision of, of a brain surgeon, something that you, something you, you're familiar with, right? Uh, we minimize casualties, like tactical brilliance, but we, we may be strategically incompetent, right? We, we get mired, you know, uh, let's say in Afghanistan for 20 years and uh, we withdrew and then the same people, basically the Taliban are ruling the place, but tactically we are brilliant. And so uh, the Russians are afraid of that. So uh, they developed this doctrine where they would detonate a low-yield tactical nuclear warhead on the battlefield. Potentially, like in this case, it's either in Ukraine or even it could be on the Russian territory that borders Ukraine uh, as demonstration that they're prepared to go all the way into the strategic realm. And the goal is to make us stop support that war. So that's what escalate to deescalate is. It's low yield. It's under one kiloton. The Russians are designed for that specific purpose, a very flexible arsenal of tactical warheads. Uh, we, don't, we, we don't have those types of things because we don't believe that nuclear weapons are actually usable. See, Putin, Putin understands that um, that we kind of like psychologically are not prepared and our population is not prepared um, to ever use, even though we're the ones who use them in, uh, in Japan. Uh, but those bombs were 15, the little boy and fat man that we dropped at uh, Nagasaki in Hiroshima were 15 and 20 kiloton. Well, the Russians believe that if they can just reduce the... Um, uh, the, 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 the power, right, uh, the fallout will be smaller, and they view it as a, tech, as a battlefield, battlefield um, um, weapon, right, and while we uh, view it as, uh, as a psychological right. weapon. So the Russians right. hold now 1 to 10 ratio advantage in tactical nukes. We, um, we have 200, they have 2,000. And that's wow. why they believe that uh, they could compel us to either stop uh, supporting the war or they can actually win. If, if it ever goes into the nuclear realm, they're prepared to win. And that's why my, my book is called Putin's uh, Playbook, Russia's Secret Plan to Defeat America. Uh, but the thing is, the, the, the Russians, just to explain, uh, the Russians are not planning to you know, come to the United States, invade us or anything else. Uh, the strategy was developed to uh, have us back off, to just to 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 just tell, compel us not to mess in what they perceive as their, you know, uh, as their backyard, as their what they call strategic security perimeter of which Ukraine is part 
uh, so they can't, they don't want to Ukraine in NATO because NATO is an adversarial alliance to Russia. Uh, why was it important to write that book when you did back in 2021, well before Ukraine was invaded? Uh, I always thought that uh, this is what Putin was going to do. In fact, I, you know, I predicted this uh, this conflict, uh, and I wrote about it in my book. The reason I wrote the book, uh, Dr. Carson, is because. Um, Basically, I was warning within the intelligence community, I was warning about the Russian threat uh, for several years, right? In fact, I briefed scores and scores of uh, military commanders, uh, the Obama's White House, National Security Council, uh, some congressional uh, staffers, um, the several combatant commands, STRATCOM, Strategic Command, which is actually in charge of our U.S. Uh, nuclear weapons, uh, Northern Command that uh, protects the homeland from missile strikes, the same command that uh, just recently missed the, uh, uh, the Chinese spy balloon. So um, I briefed NATO actually uh, in Brussels, uh, all of the military leaders and uh, uh, NATO ministers of uh, 28 countries. It was back, back then it was 28. Uh, I briefed them in September uh, 2013 in the run-up to Putin's invasion of Crimea. No one wanted to lift a finger. Uh, no one. In fact, uh, President Obama uh, pursued a reset policy with Putin. He wants. He wanted to be friends with Putin, even though you know it's impossible, right? Um, uh, curiously, actually, every uh, U.S. president wanted to become friends with Putin, right? Uh, Putin is the right. same man. He was the same, you know, KGB operative, you know, right. cunning, deceitful. Uh, but he was able to, you know, to outplay pretty much uh, most, most uh, U.S. presidents except one. Um, and, uh, and so... Uh, Eventually, uh, I was actually dismissed uh, from the intelligence uh, community because um, they, the, uh, my analysis did not align with the agenda of the senior uh, leadership. Remember, they were after the so-called uh, Trump-Russia uh, collusion, right? right, which was a complete hoax. And so my analysis did not align with that. Right. And... Um, um, and, and, and yes, and oh, in fact, not only that, I was told I was delusional that Putin <laughs> would decide to, yes, yes, they told me I had a mental illness if I think that Putin is going to invade another country, you <laughs> know. And so, uh, so eventually I just uh, wrote this book, and in my book I disclosed uh, before anyone else uh, um, was talking about it that the Trump Russia collusion uh, was uh, fake. Uh, it didn't exist. Uh, the Russians outplayed the FBI. They effectively served up, you know, this whole disinformation that the uh, Christopher Steele, you know, picked up. Um, Danch you got Danchenko was That's basically um, affiliated with Russian intelligence. And so I wrote all of this in my book. And guess what? Uh, the U.S. government, uh, DIA, my former agency, DIA and CIA, tried to sabotage the publication of my book because mm, uh, I, yes, I, I exposed basically all the incompetence, you know, that uh, exists in the intelligence community as far as Putin's mind said, you know, Russia in general. I exposed the whole uh, Russia-Trump collusion. And uh, if I may, I want to show your readers um, your listeners, rather, what they did, what the DIA, and, and so this is just uh, one example, right? This chapter is on the cyber, on the cyber uh, weapons and Putin's cyber strategy, but a very revealing one is uh, the chapter on uh, election interference. Um, it's part of another doctrine called active measures. So this is... Um, so I'll start, I'll, if, if you allow me, um, every chapter I start with a quote from either Putin 
or, or uh, some military strategist like uh, Sun Tzu. So this is how the chapter begins on subversion, all warfare. And it's very um, uh, appropriate right now to talk about it because of what just happened with this fake coup, right? Uh, Sun Tzu said, all warfare is based primarily on deception of an enemy. Fighting on a battlefield is the most primitive way of making war. There's no art higher than to destroy your enemy without a fight by subverting anything of value in the enemy's country. And then I proceeded to talk about the, um, uh, what happened in 2016, and this is what DIA do. This is all mm. blacked out the beginning. Wow. Okay. Wow. So uh, it, it was, uh, it's incredible. But this is, so what I have discovered that there are similarities actually between, you know, uh, the Russian government and uh, the deep state, right? They, they uh, you know, the censorship is, 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 is a tool that uh, authoritarians use, you know, to uh, prohibit free speech, to stifle. You know, it's the same people who told us that, oh, COVID came, you know, from whatever naturally occurring, right? While well, we found out later uh, that it came from a lab. I, you know, I knew mm -hmm. the lab, you know, they told us that uh, Trump uh, colluded with, uh, with Putin. Well, the Trump mm -hmm. campaign was scrambling. Uh, you know, they didn't have any contacts within the Putin government when, uh, when they actually won, right? It's... Yeah. Uh, and so th this is why I wrote this book. I wanted uh, the American people to know, A, first, what the real uh, Russian threat is, Putin's mindset, but also uh, I described my story uh, that right. reveals the corruption within, within the U.S. government. And uh, my story did not make the headlines like the whistleblowers right now, you know, uh, good for them, that the, from the FBI, but they're, they're like hundreds of us, uh, people like that, who, if your analysis doesn't align with the party line, with the group thing, you, right. you, you will be punished, you'll be destroyed. Well, we uh, can see those influences uh, that have affected this country significantly. Earlier this week, you know, my uh, American Cornerstone Facebook page was canceled because they said it didn't conform with community standards. And I happened to be doing some interviews when I found that out. So I just mentioned it on a couple of stations. And uh, literally within eight hours, they said, oh, it was a mistake. We just made a mistake. Now we're, we're putting it back up. But, uh, you know, they tried it. And it's funny how all the mistakes only happen in one direction. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent observation. So who is, I always wanted to Dr. Carson. Who is the community? <laughs> like, who are those exactly. uh, those people? Are they like uh, Soviet, you know, type KGB, you know, apparatchiks, the Bolsheviks, yes. the American Bolsheviks <laughs> the, the, that, that are doing this stuff? When you find out, please let me know, sir. When we look at the Soviet Union and we look at people like Stalin and, and some of their philosophies, and, you know, one of the things that Stalin said, which really... Uh, stuck with me. He says, it doesn't matter how the people vote. It matters who counts the votes. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, now you educated me about something, something uh, too. I, um, I have another one. Um, I don't remember which Soviet leader said um, to uh, a U.S. leader, he said, the the problem uh, with democracy and democratic elections is that you never know if he's going to win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, t I tell you, between, uh, between Stalin, Lenin, and Khrushchev, they've given, if you go and read some of the stuff they said, uh, it should give you chills. And to recognize that some of that influence is, is being uh, transmitted to our country now, and people don't even know it, and they don't really realize that they're being manipulated, that we, the American people, are not each other's enemies, but they're manipulating us and putting us in positions uh, so that we actually accomplish their goals. 
and and that's where the term useful idiots comes from you know we're we're destroying ourselves without even recognizing it and it's all being orchestrated and you know we're working very hard to try to uh to help people to see what's going on and you've been a tremendous help uh in doing that you're just an incredible person and uh we're so thankful that you have taken it upon yourself, knowing that you would be persecuted to reveal the truth, because that's what it's all about. And do you have any parting words for our audience? The parting words is that we need to unite, um, like you said, because right now we're like fighting, uh, you know, Democrats, Republicans, conservatives, liberals, uh, we need to unite and see the truth. And I think I really appreciate, you know, that uh, your podcast is called Common Sense, right? Because you can't beat common sense. Like, common sense applies to everybody, Republicans, everybody. So if people could just open uh, their eyes and, uh, and start thinking clearly, and um, then they will see the truth. So. Amen. Well, thank you so much. I hope people will get you. But where can people get your book? Uh, anywhere, really, on on Amazon or at any any store. Um, any store, just Google it. Uh, Rebecca Koffla, Putin's Playbook, and uh, you'll get it. And if anybody actually wants this book uh, signed, um, you can send me an email, and I will send a uh, signature plate with a special message, and it works like a sticker. You basically uh, stick it, and you have a signed book. And the email address that they should use? Um, it's rk at rebeccacoffler.com. Just Google Beautiful. my name. Uh, I've done my, yeah, I'm on all social media, uh, Twitter, Getter, so, True Social. So I'm easily uh, discoverable. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for being a patriot. Your courage is exemplary. And we appreciate you coming on the program today. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Carson, for having me. I hope you enjoyed that segment with Rebecca Koffler. You know, it's very interesting to see how the Russian leader, Putin, who was a KGB agent, uh, is actually very, very clever. And... Uh, they know how to manipulate things. There's no question that they are doing a lot of manipulation in our country. What we have to do is be smart enough to realize that we're being manipulated. Don't fall for all this stuff. Uh, because if we do, then Khrushchev's prediction will come true when he said to, to Eisenhower, your grandchildren's children will live under communism and we won't have to fire one shot. We're moving rapidly in that direction. Think about the incredible things that happened in this country and the incredible opportunities that it has provided, not only for this country, but for the rest of the world. We are a gift and a beacon for the world. We can't allow ourselves to be manipulated into destruction. We can do this. This is America, the can-do country not the what-can-you-do-for-me country. And the prescription for this week, talk about who we are to your friends and your families and pray for our country and pray for our leaders because we've got a lot on our plate right now. And if we don't do the right things, we're going to be destroyed like so many other pinnacle nations that have come before us. The warnings are all there. We just need to heed those warnings. And that's it for this week. And I want you to make sure you go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher or wherever you get your broadcast and your podcast. And make sure you rate us, review us, tell your friends about us. We have got to spread common sense. We've got to make it common again. And remember the cornerstone principles. Faith, liberty, community, and life. See you next week. <laughs>